Hey everybody, we are back live at livecoding.ca. My name is Nick Taylor, your host, and I'm hanging out with Zach Leatherman today. Zach, how are you doing today? Hey, good. How are you? I mean, you just said that. I don't know why I asked you again. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. It's all good. I'm, I'll say I'm doing amazing for the second time. There we go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so... Um, so we're going to get into a few things here today, but uh, the, the main thing is we're going to talk about WebC, which uh, I'm not sure if it's a new framework or it's a new tool to enable a framework. So we'll get into that too, I guess. Um, yeah. But I guess uh, kind of maybe give the, the, the short of what WebC is, and then we can kind of talk about some things that are related to WebC, and then we can kind of dig into WebC some more. Yeah, I mean, I, I have struggled with the answer to this question for, for a while now because I wonder what the best elevator pitch is because for 11D specifically, 11D is the static site generator that I maintain. Um, yeah. WebC solves a lot of different problems. Um, and really the biggest problem it solves for 11D is that bring, it brings components to 11D. So historically, 11D yeah. has been more page level based. Um, okay. and doesn't really d dive into like component frameworks as much. Um, but okay. in terms of a larger picture, I feel like the, the, the place that WebC sits is that, um, it is a preprocessor for web components. Um, and web okay. components is kind of the platform, uh, story for components that are that's part of the web standards and web platform um so you don't okay. need, need any like additional libraries on top of it um so okay, cool. yeah i mean that's like a super long hard answer to that question because <laughs> um there's just like a lot of problems that it solves um and that's one of the reasons that i felt like it was the right time to build it Cool, cool. Um, I dropped a link to web components from uh, the Mozilla Developer Network there that folks can check out. Um, I have some experience with web components, but it's it's been pretty minimal. Um, when I used to, I kind of delved into it a bit, like kind of, I don't even remember when, like maybe five or six years ago. And the, there's a few things to it. Like uh, there's like a, a template, which is, a, sorry, a template element, which is where you put your markup for your said component. And then you have some script uh, related to it if you want. And uh, you also have style that is, as far as I know, it's supposed to be scoped to the component. But I've I've listened to a few podcasts and I think you can it can leak out in certain scenarios. And um, um, I, I guess just, I guess like what, there's a few things here. Like I know a lot of people throw shade around web components and i think that's really yeah. more just people who are big into frameworks saying they're not great i i honestly don't hate web components i just haven't had to use them a lot we've when i worked at dev.2 before we had a few of them though we had like a web share component and mm -hmm. we were using we weren't using react at dev2 it was a rails monolith but we we used preact js to have what i kind of coined there as bespoke islands, I guess, architecture, because it was really just loading small pockets of interactivity with Preact, and Preact supports web components out of the box. I think, and this is not throwing shade on React, but I think every framework or library that builds with components supports web components except for React. I know there's a, I know there's a, Git, a PR or a GitHub issue, but that's kind of what I've understood, but I don't know if you want to maybe speak to that long. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like, there. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, a bunch of different points that we could go into there, but I feel like the big one is that um, folks with a lot of existing framework and component framework backgrounds had a set of yeah. expectations for what they wanted web components to solve. And the yeah. additional problem on top of that is that web components is a little bit nebulous. Like it's a nebulous like definition of a bunch of different technologies that are part of the platform um, that live under the web components umbrella. Um, and so yeah. for me, web components is primarily custom elements, which is a way to okay. have a custom HTML tag in your document. Um, and yeah you can um, enhance that or progressively enhance that with the custom elements API that allows you to add the client-side scripting for that element. Um, so okay. 
if you have jQuery background, the benefits of custom elements seem very obvious because you don't have to do any like very expensive DOM selections. You don't have to do any okay. query selectors to find elements that you want to progressively enhance or add client side JavaScript to. Um, so in that respect, when you come from uh, uh, the pre-React jQuery world, um, mm -hmm. I feel like web components and custom elements, especially um, the benefit of those becomes very obvious. And so yeah. there's, I think there's a lot of mismatched expectations about what framework folks expect web components to solve um, out of the box. But I do also feel like there's, um, I don't know, there's, I don't know how to say this nicely, but um, there's, <laughs> Uh, it's okay. I'm sure this isn't recorded or live, so go ahead. <laughs> there's just, I feel like there's two separate sets of goalposts for what framework authors expect and what um, what uh, everyone else expects. I, I feel like web components are held to a higher standard because okay. there's a lot of overlap with what framework authors have already solved. Um, and for me, yeah. the benefit of web components is that it's built into the platform and you get a whole bunch of things for free. Um, that you yeah. wouldn't otherwise have using vanilla JavaScript. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. For so, sure. I think. Yeah. I, I think some interesting things about it are like like a web component has its own. Like I definitely haven't done a ton of stuff here, but I I, I have dabbled and web components have their own uh, component lifecycle. Uh, like you can just add listeners and stuff, and then, and I guess at least I remember. Initially, when I was doing React, you know, it's like, well, React and other frameworks, the com components have a life cycle of their own. So then like the web component doing its own thing, you know, it's kind of, at least in the context of React, you know, they, they usually would promote immu immutability in terms of like what props come into a component that's, you know, you'll always get the same thing. I mean, it's it's a concept because un the underlying thing is is dom that gets generated which is immutable and it's it's never the same it's it's the theory that it's the same cuz it's the same props coming in but uh, yeah with i guess there was the conflict of that with like not necessarily conflict but they're like why do we need web components if this is already doing a life cycle but but i know web components came before a lot of these frameworks as well and there's, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to be uh, biased here because I'm I, like, I'm not biased, sorry. Uh, trying to be open-minded here. Like I, I, I haven't currently really had a need to use web components. The, uh, but another thing I've been thinking about a lot was like, uh, I'll, I'll go back to the Dev2 example, but like at one point, uh, Suzanne, who's our coworker at Netlify now, who I used to work with at Dev2, um, we were in, cause we were the front end team there and we needed to have this, you know, like in Twitter, when you go at somebody's name and then you get a list and stuff, it's mm. actually not entirely accessible on Twitter and in GitHub. It's, there's a lot of, it's very complicated component. So we reached out to uh, some components in the React ecosystem uh, from a component library called Reach UI, which is from like the, uh, the people that run React training and Remix and stuff. And we went with that because we were like react has such a huge ecosystem of components and there was a lot of accessible components so that's where uh yeah, todd's saying what not accessible yeah sorry todd's a accessibility expert if nobody's getting why he's saying that but um hey todd so like that's <laughs> but so you know i i was i was very bullish on like the ecosystem is huge so let's go with that stuff and and the thing that I've been thinking about more lately, even though I haven't really been using web components is I always say like React has a huge ecosystem of components, you know, but if you were to create a rich ecosystem of web components that had these accessible primitives, you know, like not primitives, but like people building well, well-crafted accessible web components, then it wouldn't matter which framework you're using. It's just... I don't think we've seen that yet. And I know that like Dave Rupert from uh, Luro, he's been working on a ton of stuff with, I can't remember the name of the project. It's open something um, like there's an accordion open component, UI? tabs component. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I know they're big into web components there and kind of driving that. Uh, but I think that's one thing I've, I, 
that I've personally noticed. I don't know what your thoughts are on that or like, and this ties into yeah. like adoption of them. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like that, that, that is a problem that has been solved, but there is a, another dimension to it. <laughs> so there is an existing library that yeah. I think is, is very well developed and very well done. Um, and it's okay. called shoelace. If you go to shoelace.style, okay. um, but really yeah. that, that web components library is intended to be client side rendered. Like the progressive enhancement yeah. story is not great for that one. Um, but it, yeah. when you're comparing it to client side rendered React or client side rendered any any number of other of these frameworks, um, I think yeah. it competes in the same in the same mechanism. I think it's it's very well developed in that way. Okay. Um, I just think the progressive enhancement story could be a little bit better for some of the components. Okay. And this is a perfect segue to go and talk about WebC because one one thing that I've heard constantly on, well, not constantly, but occasionally on Twitter is like, you know, what's the server side rendering story of web components? And, and this is something that I always, it always confused me. And we talked about this briefly a, a few weeks ago um, when you were going to come on, but you know, for a web component to work on a page, you have to register it with some JavaScript. Uh, as far as I know, like that's the only way you can add it, right? To some degree. Well, there's or... a couple of different ways you can do it. I mean, the. Okay. And I did kind of talk about this in the 11D meetup that I did, the talk I did last week, but really it's about okay. how much you want for free as part of your authoring experience. So you can have, okay. um, if you want to maintain progressive enhancement markup, you can do that today with web components, but you will okay. be forced to duplicate all of the child content throughout any usage of that component. So you need to maintain okay, yeah. all of the light, it's sometimes called light DOM or the default slot, um, the content okay. that's just the child of your custom element. You have to maintain that in all of the instances um, of that component that's used throughout your project. So you can get into a spot where you're basically copying and pasting giant snippets mm -hmm. of markup throughout your project to get the right progressive okay. enhancement story. And for some components that works fine and for some components it doesn't. So I have a web component that's called details utils, which adds some yeah. additional things to the details element. And really the only thing that it operates on is it's a wrapper around any existing details elements. Um, so you can put one or more details. Yeah, there it is. One or more details yeah. elements inside of it, and it will enhance okay. those. Um, and so the progressive enhancement of the story of that one is very obvious, right? Because when JavaScript doesn't run, it just uses the stock details summary yeah. um, that's that's available in Web Component, or excuse me, it's part of the platform. Um, okay. So to me, that's that's a very good example of this is a web component. It operates on existing mm -hmm. HTML. Um, the HTML is being passed in as part of the web component. And then enhancements are layered on top of that. So the, okay. the problem comes, uh, the bigger problem comes when you don't want to duplicate all of your, or when you have it. So just say for an example, I think a very good um, example of this might be like an image comparison component. So if you go back to okay. like the shoelace style um, or the shoelace dot style oh, yeah. um, repository, you can kind of see they have an image comparison. I don't remember exactly what they call it, but it should be on the left bar. No, no, no. Just go back to the demo page. Oh, sorry. Okay. And if you scroll down on the left, there should be like an image comparison. Yeah, keep going. Image oh, comparer. Image comparer. comparer. Um, okay. So when you have a component like this, what would you expect the progressive enhancement story to be? Um, when you disable JavaScript, I would expect that, um, and I wouldn't do it on this demo page because you'll get a white screen, but um, I would expect that the images, like both images will be shown um, stacked okay. vertically because it uses uh, image elements as the fallback HTML. Um, okay. 
And so the, the more you think about like what you expect as the baseline experience and what you expect from the enhanced experience, then you get into some weird tensions between progressive enhancement and SSR, mm. right? Because yeah, when you, if you want a better baseline experience, what you could do with the SSR, um, you then get into uncanny valley situations where you might have a slider that's uh, doesn't do anything um, until the okay. JavaScript comes in. Um, yeah, but I don't know. That's we're, I think we're maybe jumping ahead of the game here. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. But but I'm glad you mentioned all this because this still kind of ties into. Uh, I'm not fully on well, I the way I'm understanding it, like to to have it without the progressive enhancement, which is the client side interactivity of the web component, is is the server side rendering story possible just because the dom is forgiving like for example if i if i create an element you know potato and then within there i put the the details element you know uh, my version of user details it'll render it'll just ignore potato right it, it'll just i guess it will assume it's like a presentation element like a div or something is that what happens or yeah, so as I think as far back as maybe IE9 or IE8, you can have just any random HTML element and it would just be ignored by the by the HTML parser. Um, so if, a, if the HTML parser doesn't recognize an element, it will just um, output it as plain and ignore it and not add okay. any extra functionality to it. Okay, so that, okay, that definitely clears up some misunderstanding I had. So, so that's, that's, that's the way that you'll be able to say, I can server side render this. And then if you decide to register client side interactivity for that web component, then we can bootstrap that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, so that's that's pretty clear in my head now. So so let's talk about web C now. So um, we'll just go to that. I have the link here, but I, I guess like you mentioned, it's, I guess uh, you weren't sure if it was, a, it, is it a target? for a framework that this is what I wasn't clear about. I know you said you had a bit of trouble figuring out how to best define it too. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do think web C has value outside of 11 D. And so I did create it as a, as a separate, uh, utility that does not require 11 D to use. And we've seen a few, okay. um, different integrations come in, come up. I saw, uh, my NK who seemed like followed as part of this stream. I was working on yeah, a yeah, she's, plugin. Uh, she's playing with the poop emoji in the, in the, in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and then I think that there's another integration um, from Nick Colley that's uh, express based. So if you want to add web seed to express. Um, and okay. so the JavaScript API for it is pretty simple. You just feed it uh, an input file or a string of web C and it will compile okay. it for you. Okay. 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 So that's okay. I, I, I guess I was, I was slightly confused because it's under the 11 D organization, but that's just what made sense for now, I guess. Uh, but it's not 11 yeah, I mean, specific. Correct. Yeah. I mean, 11 D has a bunch of different utilities that are not tightly coupled to 11 D. Um, okay. we have an image plugin that doesn't require 11 D to use, um, okay. our is land web component for partial hydration is not tightly coupled to 11 D. Um, okay. and yeah, other frameworks have started to use those, um, sort of decoupled utilities as well. I think okay. Astro uses the image plugin somewhere. Okay. No, nice, nice, nice. Always nice to see the, the frameworks, uh, riffing off each other. So that's great. Um, yeah. okay. So this is, this is awesome. I, I kind of have a, uh, I hope uh, I hope the folks in the chat are kind of up to speed. Uh, I I feel like I have a good base to kind of like maybe we can jump into something now. So I'm a big fan of Eleven D. My my own website uses it super fast. Been using it for a long time. So super happy with that. Awesome. Um, I was I was thinking for if we could have some fun and maybe just build something out. And I guess would the, the most logical choice I think would be to just create an 11D site and then we integrate WebC into it and go that route, I guess. Yeah, that probably gives you the most for free setup um, that would allow us to okay. get going pretty quickly. Okay, I'm just gonna switch over to VS Code here. So I've just got a 
empty repo here. So I'm just going to do the, I probably should have done this before, but I'm just going to add a few things here. Whoops. MPX. Yeah. Uh, for folks that might not be aware, there's a, a handy utility uh, in the NPM registry called git ignore, and you can choose a language. So I'm generating a, a node git ignore right away here. And uh, I'm just going to do a, let's do a code uh, readme. Won't put anything in there for now, but do, 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 do. just me making weird noises while I try to code stuff. Uh, let's web C fun. All right, cool. Let's save that. And we're definitely going to deploy to Netlify. So let's initialize that. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I, I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it later, I guess. Cool. Uh, web C is cool. All right. So we're pretty much set up here. Oh, and I need to do NPM init. All right. So now we got our baseline to just kind of get started. So the first thing we need to do, I guess, is add, um, 11 T. Yeah. So NPM install at one one T Y slash eleven D. Is it the word eleven D or I yeah? I, 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 I it's been in my repo so long I don't even remember. Uh, okay, cool. I mean that's so that's definitely started. not a point of confusion that everyone has mentioned to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm all, I'm always like use, anytime I, I write it. <laughs> why does he use the numbers? Yeah. The numbers exist because uh the name was taken on social media <laughs> pretty much. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. So we got 11 installed and then I guess we need to install web C, which is at 11. Oh, you Slash will actually need to go back. Sorry. I told you the wrong command because we need the canary version oh. of, uh, 11 oh, to okay, use web C. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, at, yeah, at canary. Okay. There we go. And that would, that will install much quicker than, <laughs> The 1.0 version. Okay. Commit. All right, cool. All right. So, okay. And now we need to add the web C, right? Yeah. So, uh, to use web C in 11 D we have the 11 D plugin for that. So it's uh, yeah. One, one, two, I slash 11 D dash. Yep. Sorry. No, go back. 11 yeah. D dash plugin. Yeah. Okay. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> one, one, two, I slash. Um, <laughs> eleven this is the rest of the string. We're the figuring word. out the package name. Okay. <laughs> dash plugin. Dash web C. Okay. okay, cool. Nope. Dash All web right. C. Oh, dash. There it is. Here we go. There we go. All right. Okay. Thirty minutes later in the stream. Okay, we have it installed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, what is that? I don't remember what it is, but there's that thing where you sell, tell someone your donate dom, your domain name and it has a bunch of, or no, you tell them your email address and it has a bunch of numbers and words that are numbers spelled out. I feel like I'm doing uh, that right now. Yeah, you go to 11ty11d11. Uh, so <laughs> don't forget to hit the pound sign and then you'll get yeah. on the party line. Uh... <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. Um, um, yeah. So the name, uh, the command's escaping me to start 11D. Is it just uh, 11D start? I can't remember. Uh, um, no, it's MPX, and then just the 11TY package name. Oh, at 11TY yeah. slash 11D. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right there. Serve. Okay. Cool. And this. Oh, is that Copilot? Serve. Oh yeah, I've got that installed. They, uh, and, uh, an advantage of working in open source is you get Copilot for free. So at least for now nice. I do. So I'd probably pay for it though. I, I find it pretty useful. Uh, it's it, sometimes on a stream, it can be a little troublesome because if you're trying to explain something, but most of the time I think it's, it's okay at guiding you and stuff. And, uh, hmm. I think it's, I think if you were learning a new language, I think it could help you get past syntax barriers quicker. Cause you know, you just want to do something and then like 
or like adding a for loop and stuff. So uh, <laughs> my ex saying it, it keeps suggesting buggy code. So uh, maybe maybe not always <laughs> great. It's better than what I normally okay. write. Okay, so we got 11 working here. So I'm just going to copy that into my browser instead of it opening. I'm not really expecting anything in here. That's expected. Okay, so we've got 11 running now. So what's next? Yeah, so the next thing is we will need to uh, add the plugin as part of our configuration. Um, so we'll need okay. to make a configuration file. Okay, I'll have to stop the server, right? Uh, it's dot eleven d dot js, right? Yeah, you can do that, or we actually, as part of some of the later canaries, you can do eleven d dot config dot js if you don't want a dot file, okay, which I think perfect. is. Yeah, I'll do I that. don't know. I prefer that now. Yeah, well, because when it's a dot, it's it's like a hidden file, and depending on your mm -hmm. settings and stuff, and and I've actually seen that when some people actually copy the zips of uh, repos sometimes. And I remember we mm. had, had this problem on another and it wouldn't take the dot file. So like people would be opening issues like, oh, there's no config or whatever. So yeah, um, yeah, that makes okay. sense. All right, cool, cool, cool. So, all right, so uh, it's been a while since I've done this from scratch because I set up my blog post uh, blog a long time ago. So is it a default export for the config or? Uh, yeah, it? module exports. And then okay. you'll export the function. Yeah. I wrote module. And then the is argument is, um, yeah, you want to pass a function into it. And then the argument is 11 config or whatever you want to name it. Yeah. I'll just do config. Okay. All right. And then we want to do config.add plugin. Oh, there's Copilot just. Uh... It's taking you off the rails. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you want to. I mean, that will work if you want to just replace syntax highlight with WebZ. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, this is where this is where the point when I I notice in the stream that it's like, oh, maybe it's being a little too helpful and it's not exactly what I want. But then I have to reload VS Code, so I kind of abort that and just let it keep going. But all right. So we've got the config here uh, for the plugin. Okay. And yeah, that's kind of it. You can make a, you can now make a WebC file in your folder, and it will compile WebC. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, what's what's the convention you use in Eleven D usually? Do you have a source uh, SRC folder? Is that the the general practice you do in Eleven D? Um, I mean, what do I do, or what does Eleven D allow you to do? You can put the file anywhere. It the the root. Uh, project directory is the default input directory. So you could okay. put a WebC file at the root of your project and it will compile it. Okay, well, we'll keep it at the root for now. So just a dot WebC? Yeah. Okay, all right, so we got that there, okay. And then inside of a WebC file, you can put just any arbitrary HTML. So if you have like a okay. boilerplate macro or whatever, I'm oh, okay. You want me to put a full HTML file or, or just yeah, something? yeah, it will. Ex I mean, it will work, but I think you want a full HTML file for it to render properly in the browser. Yes. Okay, but I'm it would work gonna, with Marquee. Uh, you can try that. Let's do it. Yeah, let's yeah, see if we can get it to. Do, okay. I know Marquee is deprecated and it's not accessible, but it's it's always a fun one to just at least demo. That is neat. Okay, so we got that there. And okay, then so... I believe you can just start the server and it will go. Um, because we named this file fun.webc, um, I believe that URL that will uh, output is slash fun slash. Okay, let's go here. So just slash fun. There we go. There it okay. is. So I guess I guess my first comment is that was pretty quick to get up and running. I mean, it's pretty fast to get up and running with 11e in general, but that's just kind of neat. I created a web component and it's right there. Well, the start of what we're doing here. So, okay, cool. So we got that going on. All right. So yeah, I, I'm okay. curious if you view source. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you'll so see a couple no... of things going on here. 
Okay, so that's, that's just the 11D uh, hot reloader. reloader. Yeah. Okay. And so it really didn't do anything um, because it, you're yeah. just it's just outputting the same t tag that you put in. Okay. Now, yeah. what we can do um, is that we can make we can make a marquee component that will then intercept this HTML and allow us to transfer transform it into whatever we want. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, let me just put on word wrap here. Okay, cool. And uh, we don't need to slide for now. Okay, so uh, so where would we go about doing that? Because we have the the Web C component here now. And yeah, so there's a there's a couple of different ways you can do components in Web C, um, in and in 11D. So in Web C, there's a a Web C import attribute that you can uh, import another component in line. Um, but I really think to demonstrate the, the most um, power of WebC and 11 specifically, we'll want to make like a global components folder that will okay. um, apply to all of our, um, okay. to all of our WebC files. Okay. And so the, we'll make a components kind of the, folder. Yeah, you can do it this way. Um, you will need to likely declare this components folder as like your includes folder or hide it from 11D's page processing. Like, so in 11D, we have okay. an includes folder by de like underscore includes folder by default that gets ignored. And that's kind of used for our layouts and imports okay. and uh, templates and text, different like different templates and text features that you might use. So okay. yeah, I would move that. Uh, I mean, you could rename oh, okay. that folder, or you can move it. Okay, so just a underscore includes folder, you said. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. And if you wanted to use okay. the, the components folder name, you would just have to uh, say in your configuration file that I'm mapping the includes folder to be components. But okay. if you want the most for free fee, uh, functionality without having to do anything in configuration, you just use the underscore includes. OK, so let's do that. Let's uh, let's not make it over complicated since we just trying to demonstrate something here. So there we go. OK, so in the includes folder, are we going to move the existing fun.webc in there, or are we creating something new now? No, I would leave that template as is and make a new file inside of the includes folder called marquee.webc. Okay. And so the tag okay. name here kind of tells WebC, um, or excuse me, the file name tells WebC what the tag name should be in your HTML. Okay. So gotcha. yeah, just put any arbitrary content inside of this. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll packages are awesome. If folks haven't clued in yet, I like alpacas. There's a lot outside of my town for some reason. OK, so we've got, this is our air quotes marquee web component. OK. Yeah. And so there is one more thing you need to do in your configuration file is you need to point it to your global components folder. Now, I don't know if this is going to be something that will always be this way, but there is a second argument to add plugin um, that is just an object. And yeah, we'll want to have a components property in there that basically points to our includes folder. OK. Um, so it's yeah, string. To the root. OK. Yeah. No, not components. And do I just put web C, uh, sorry, uh, marquee.webc in there, or just say it's the folder? Uh, I would put star at webc so it gets all the files inside of it. If you want to have a okay. deeply nested thing, you would do star star slash star at webc, but we'll keep it simple for now. Okay, I'm just going to restart the server. Okay. Um, I do have to restart the server when I change the config, right? Or does it reload the config? I would consider it a bug if you did have to restart the server. So. Okay, it you was should. more a question. Well, maybe I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I think I always assumed you had to because I'm used to other frameworks when you change the... Comment it out and try again. Let me know if it's yeah. a bug. <laughs> Let's test it live. We're testing it live. <laughs> it's gone down. 
<laughs> okay, so okay, so this is gonna say we we've registered the the plugin uh, Web C component and components are coming from the includes folder, basically a glob of any Web C uh, in there. Okay, perfect. Yep. And so yeah, I would rerun it uh, and then see what comes back. Okay, and for the for this file here, it should pick up the Web C Leave it. marquee. Okay. All right. So yeah. let's see here. All right. You can. Oh, there we go. Hot reloaded. Okay. So. Okay. So if you look at the source of this, you'll see that the, we overrode the marquee element uh, with our own component okay. definition. So anytime we use marquee in our project now, we'll get this arbitrary, like this component content back. Um, and this okay. is this is WebC's notion of an HTML only component. Um, okay. No, this is super. If you want to, uh, go ahead. I uh, sorry, I was I was gonna say this is well, this is interesting to me because so this is the server side rendered story. Like it put alpacas are awesome, but once we get to the client side interactivity, that's when you can obviously start manipulating the the inner HTML or or anything within the component. So. That, that's, that's yeah cool. right yeah and okay. so you can kind of it, this is uh this is where WebC is a little bit different than custom elements and web components because custom elements have a very strict naming structure um so custom okay. elements requ are, require a dash in the tag name and in WebC you can overload um any html tag you can overload a paragraph tag if you want to you can overload an image tag if you want to and i'll have okay. some more like demo videos coming out about how to do that specifically i think a cool one is going to be overloading the image tag to use the 11 image utility to process uh, images okay. and optimize images for you automatically oh that's super cool that's super cool Okay, so we've got this here now. We've got the, so like I could essentially for now, I could just do this. And so now if I want to add some interaction. I honestly don't know if that will work, to be honest. Oh, rolling the dice, breaking things in prod. Let's see it. Go. Let's see it. Oh, seems to be good. Okay, I, I would note that uh, one wrinkle of HTML parsers in general is that custom elements require can't be void elements. They need starting and ending tags, and that's just part of the HTML specification. Um, so yeah. that is one limitation, I would say. I wish you could do void elements with with um, custom okay. elements specifically, but yeah, if you want to do um, yeah your own custom tag name, you will need to do a start and a start and end element. Okay. But marquee looks like it works fine. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if that's legacy because you know what I mean. Like, like you can have. I mean, HTML has always been pretty forgiving. Like you know, inputs without a closing tag or like just a mm. self closing. Uh, br. I remember when I used to do brs. I never had slashes. And then I think when XHTML came out, that's when I like started getting super strict. And then, uh, and then I just kind of stuck with it. I guess it's it feels dirty yeah, to I me think... when I don't have a closing tag. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think the that's the exact dis disconnect, right? If you don't have an <clears throat> an XML style parser, you don't know at the starting tag if it's going to be void or not, and that's why yeah. the void elements require you require the parser needs to know about all of the void elements up front, um, and that's why okay. custom elements have that limitation. Okay, no, that's good to know. Okay, so yeah, so we've got, it looks like we've got the server side story here. And so now say we want to add some interactivity to this. So we want to make our, I don't know, we'll do something fun with our, our makeshift marquee. And the interesting thing about this is like I, I mentioned initially, marquee is deprecated, but we're essentially reviving it. Uh, well, I don't know if you could, you know, which is kind of interesting, I think, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so uh, if if we were to add some kind of interactivity to this now, is it uh, you know is it similar to like some other frameworks where like would I put a script tag in here now like where it's all kind of co-located or? Okay. Yeah, so there is a couple of different features that you get in WebC specifically, and 
and asset bundling is one of them. So component asset bundling. So if you add a style tag here um, or a some client side JavaScript, um, WebC will bundle that up for you. Now, if we want that to be bundled up, we'll need to move our page to use like an 11D layout because we need to use an 11D layout to output those bundles um, okay, in yeah. line on the page. Um, okay. So I think we probably want to move to use a layout before we go down that road. Okay, and that's uh, underscore layouts, or is it just under includes? You said, or yeah, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can, uh, I think that by convention, there's an underscore layouts folder that you can use. Yeah, I I, I say I use my blog with 11D, and it's like I, I there's so many of these things I set up so long, such a long time ago. It's like I never touch yeah. them. So. It's a, okay, yeah, I mean, so as a layouts. as a maintainer, I don't I don't really use the layouts folder all that much either. So it's I I won't be honest. I was struggling a little bit to remember the name of it, um, but yeah. Okay, all right. So we could just say I don't know global, and it's a .h. Uh, is this a numchuck file then, or, uh, or you can, can do whatever we want. We can have a WebC um, layout okay. as well. All right, let's go web C. Uh, one thing interesting I'm noticing, and th this is specifically to the editor, uh, but it could it could be an interesting project to add like a, a web C extension or something, because what happens is right now, like I created the web C file, but like uh, mm. Visual Studio Code, and I would assume other editors, they it's detecting it as plain text because it's never seen web C, I guess, or mm -hmm. actually I can do it in my con in my config actually. Yeah, there is a, a preference inside of VS Code, and I have that on the yeah. docs, um, where you yeah, can add an alias some... for HTML. Yeah, because I have one for Nunchuck as well. Uh, where is it? None. No, that's not it. Well, I'll fix it later. But yeah, you're right. No, I could I could just do it in the settings. Um, but just yeah, to, if you go to preferences to and then settings and then your file associations, I think is the thing that you want. Okay. File associations. File associate. Oh, there we go. There you go. Add item. Oh, there we go. So start up web C. And then HTML. HTML. Yep. There we go. All right. Okay. We're golden now. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, you're saying, yeah, let's go back to the layout. Where did I do? Where did my layout go? Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah. We're in that. Isn't this it here? No. Oh, no, that's not it. Sorry. Um, yeah, global web C, that's what it was. OK. All right. Yeah, and I would and put yeah, so uh, H, you know, like an HTML boilerplate in there. Or like, yeah, there you go. OK. Uh, all right. Web C fun. OK. And what else do we need to add in here? I guess like a, a placeholder for the... Yeah, so in, in 11D layouts, you need to declare where your content goes on the page. So where your page content gets compiled to. So inside of um, this, we can use uh, a WebC feature called the at HTML prop, and we can just set that on the body yeah. tag. Um, oh, okay. And, it'll just and then point it to in. equals this dot content. And actually just a fun preview for folks on the stream. I finished a PR um, with Philippe uh, today that will alleviate the need to use this everywhere. <laughs> so that will be oh, nice. No um, oh, cool. Okay, so we've got this here. Uh, there's a question in the chat real quick uh, for you, Zach. Um, uh, Drakan, I don't know what the real name is, uh, says, Zach, did you think about using Dino for the project? Like, there, there's a couple of things here. Like, at Netlify, we have edge functions which use Dino, but I, I think I think Drakan's meaning more in terms of, like, build process and stuff, like just taking out Node instead, but... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there is a couple of, uh, like, a few Node-specific things in WebC, um, but... I don't, I mean, the, the lift to port them over to Dino, I think will be very small. So if folks want to okay. see Dino support for this, then definitely file an issue. Um, 
because yeah, there's just one one small class that does um, some JavaScript compilation um, that yeah. I think we can port to Dino pretty easily. Yeah, there's that, and I know Dino's. Uh, I don't know if it's finished yet, but they have uh, npm support for packages coming. So like, you might not even need to port it, or it, it it might be nice to port it just to put it in the Dino ecosystem. But uh, yeah, yeah, I think that. I mean, I'm I I'm I'm referring specifically to some Node specific features that I think Dino doesn't have. So like the VM script stuff that's built in. Um, oh, okay, okay. That will probably need some Dino specific love. Okay, cool, cool. So, okay, so we've added the at HTML attribute to the body and it's got a this.content, which I'm assuming will be whatever the component that gets injected. Dot content just means the content yeah, so, of the file. Yeah, so our page templates, so any WebC files that show up in our 11D input directory is what will show up in this content. And this is the same as any other uh, 11D layout. So we have this, like the content, variable um, okay. inside of your data cascade that that has the contents of the page um, for the 11 d layout so um, okay. yeah this is not like a, a special web C thing this is a, that's an 11 d thing okay cool cool okay so we've got our template here set up and so now we can just come back to our web C includes or yeah I would go back to our fun.webc because we need to tell I mean, there's a couple of different places we can do this, and I can take your direction, but um, yep. you need to tell, or you need to map an input template to, or a page template to use an 11D layout. So you can do this in front matter if you want, because in okay. 11D specifically, uh, you can do front matter in WebC. Um, okay. Outside of, that's just an extra feature that the 11D plugin added, okay. um, but that's not, that's not something that's native to WebC independent of 11D. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So, okay, so we can just add... So the, yeah, here. the easiest way to do it would just, yeah, that triple dash. Oh, triple dash. Uh, and then... I never do layout. this stuff manually. It's I have a generate, like, my blog's all automated now, so I set this up so long ago. It's like... Oh, nice. Anyway, anyways. Yeah, you need... Uh, it's a layout property there in your YAML, but there will be two... Like, you need a start and an end triple dash, I think, for front oh, yeah, matter. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, and then okay. global.webc, I believe, is the only thing you'll need. Okay. There we go. And we'll see if this works. No, it didn't work. What happened? Uh, let me just make that a little bigger so we can see. Uh, stack error. You're trying to use a layout that does not exist. Global.webc. Oh, I think I know what's happening. Um, we use the layouts folder but we didn't actually declare it in use uh, okay in the config you mean yeah, yeah so there's a directory for layouts yeah, paste I'll just it in up my... the chat i don't know if you can see yeah. that link but yeah, um So if you're using a separate layouts folder, I do think you need to declare it in your configuration file because the default value for layouts is um, it's mapped to the includes directory. Okay. Oh, so... it didn't include the hash link. Oh, whoops. I think that could have been, that's just me. Hold on a sec. Uh, the copy link address. Why is it? Oh, it's, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. And as I'm explaining this out loud to you, I wonder if this default should be changed. Hmm. Directory layouts for options. Food for thought. I'm gonna write that down. I feel like yeah. if the lay if the underscore if the underscore layouts folder exists, then you shouldn't have to declare it in your configuration file. Yeah, kind of like a nice auto detect. Uh, mm, yeah. 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 That's how I would have expected it to work. There's so many things that go into 11D that I feel like I forgot how it worked. And then when I have to explain it to someone, I'm like, this kind of sucks. We should change this. <laughs> hey, that's all good. It's all good. All right, cool. Let me just. I no, I think that. I feel like that's a superpower that I forget how stuff works sometimes. Yeah, no, well, that's. You see it with fresh eyes. 
yeah well that yeah and it's also great just talking through things to somebody else as well because then you know it either solidifies some knowledge or you're just like mm. oh yeah uh, okay all right so i just need to have these two defined here right yeah that'll work uh, the includes okay. property is optional there but you can leave it okay i'll i'll roll the dice hashtag yolo here we go okay so that's there and okay that seems to be okay i don't know if okay it seems to be watching now but let's try that again so if i save here now it's still complaining let's see what it's saying I'm trying to use a layout that does not exist Let's, let's there might, just do, there might uh, be a bug with the uh, layout resolution stuff and the watch. I would just try starting, restarting the server. Yep. Okay. And uh, is just my alias for npm run. So, hmm. I lied. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It would it wouldn't be a wow. good stream if something wasn't working. So uh, it's all good. Uh, yeah, okay, my... we're using. We're gonna switch to the escape hatch. We're gonna switch back to. We're gonna move our layouts folder into our includes okay. and make a make a child directory inside of includes for our components. Okay. Why is this not moving? There we go. Okay, and then yeah, you said a uh, components. Make folder, like a. Right? Yeah, I think you're making a file though. Oh yeah. Whoops. Do do do. Components and let's move marquee into there, and then we just have to update the config, right? Yep. Okay, let's come over here. So this should be components. Yeah, and I would delete that. Yeah. yeah, delete that, and then also you'll have to change your layout front matter. Okay. In fun webc. Okay, and we'll do to be underscore layouts slash there you go all right so let's all right now we're in business so if we come back here okay alpacas are still awesome and if we view the source just to see that we've got our template we do so that's great okay so now we're in business uh, we okay yeah it. we have a layout it's it's nice. layouting um okay so now we need to output the bundles inside of our layout so if okay. we go back to our layout file yep uh we're which is global.webc yep. um we can output a style block excuse me um and then use the same at html convention okay. that we used oh yeah um, okay. and then point oh, it to the... Yeah, as an attribute, yep. And then point it to this dot get CSS. Like that? I think CSS is, is all capitals. Uh oh. Let's see. And it's all caps. Yep, that's okay. it. And then you want to pass in the um, page URL to okay. that. So, okay, so as an art, yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, no, uh, parenthesis. Yep, and then this dot page dot URL. Okay. And that will get the bundle for that page, um, just for the CSS stuff. And so okay. you can do the same thing with J JavaScript. Um, if you make a script tag. There we go, and then. And then get JS. Is that all capitals too? And then yep. page dot URL again. Or... Yep. Okay. No, that's nice. Um, no, that's cool. Okay. Uh, there was something I saw in the chat. Uh, yeah, my ink was saying, uh, I think a starter project with a basic layout and a basic component would also help, which is what we did, I think. So that's mm. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Todd is saying it needs more main. Okay. So we can add a few lobsters in there. Uh, it's the uh, it's the alpaca lobster mashup you didn't ask for, but there you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so we can add some style here. So, um, and this is a question I have now about the styling. Is this scope to the web C file in terms of like kind of like how how the CSS is supposed to be scoped in an actual web component? Yeah, no, not by default. So there's a couple okay. of different ways. You can scope CSS in WebC and or as part of the platform. 
Um, and we can go through those if you want, but, uh, yeah, yeah, I would try and maybe just start with some base, uh, CSS and make sure that's showing up. Okay. Let's just do font size. Let's go. Um, but this is going to be full, full C like you can put any arbitrary CSS in here. You will need to have a tag name on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's my bad. Uh, I'm going to go with the super selector here, which is very vague, but just to start, um, okay. So no, yeah, and let's back. check that it's, um, okay, cool. Um, oh, and so this is kind of an interesting thing. So if we look at the source, yeah, you'll see now that I kind of mentioned before that, uh, in WebC, there's a notion of HTML only components. And yeah. so the default, when you make a component that doesn't have any style or JavaScript in it, it will not include the, the host tag name with it. So okay. before, when we didn't have any CSS in our component definition, it didn't include the like the host the host component tag name, which was marquee in this case. Okay, and now yeah. that we've added CSS as part of our page bundle, our CSS bundle for the components in use on the page, okay. um, it will include the the host uh, tag name because okay. the the thinking there is that we've ha we have CSS we want to style something we need a hook to style it, and okay. the reason that HTML components HTML only components in WebC don't include the host parent tag name um, is I want the default experience to be no overhead so you can use components okay. without having any extra tags uh, showing up that you don't need. Okay, gotcha. And there are conventions to override that behavior too. Okay. All right. Yeah, the yeah, marquee always always amazes me. This is like one of the first things I think a lot of people did when the web came out, that font tags and I don't know. I feel like we're of the same generation, Zach. I, I remember NCSA ah. Mosaic and like uh, all that stuff and I remember I remember when Netscape 1.2 came out, there, there was frames and frame sets and yeah. I had a, and I had the older version in Netscape and it would just crash if you tried using frame sets there. And anyways, that was just a short anecdote to date myself, but uh, anyways. <laughs> I mean, same, I found my, one of my very first websites the other, I don't know, a few years back and I had like a little 88 by 31 banner on it that said uh, <laughs> upgrade to Netscape 3.0 or something. something yeah, like yeah, that. exactly. Like, classic. Yeah. On a more depressing note, government sites here, uh, I think like even like, si not six years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, they always used to say best viewed in Internet Explorer 5.5. I was like, I don't know. I don't know how you can actually yeah. work on a website and have something like that up. But anyways, that's my, my mini rant for the day. Uh, yeah bank your bank website i feel like bank websites in the u.s are notoriously yeah. bad somehow yeah no no for sure no one needs sure. a good website to protect their money yeah cool cool sorry there's a bunch of people reminiscing about the web now in the chat <laughs> the uh yeah we cue somebody cue the ali mcbeal dancing baby animated gif uh <laughs> So, anyways, Love yeah, it. yeah, PHP, VV, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm just doing a time check here. We got about 30 minutes, so we can we can keep trudging along here. So, so that's neat that we got this here, and and this. Yeah. So I I did want to kind of go through. Sorry, did you? Do you want to no, move I, on to something else? Or can we no, talk no, no, about the other CSS things that we can do here? Yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. Okay. Um. Yeah, I would say maybe the coolest thing that's built into WebC is that you can add on your style uh, element, you can add a WebC colon scoped attribute, and okay. that will scope the CSS to, um, uh, yeah, it's colon scoped. Oh, colon. Yeah. And all the arbitrary like HTML attributes for WebC uh, are WebC colon. Um, and then if you change the the p element to be uh, colon host, okay, web c or yeah colon host yep, and web c will replace that with a with a svelte style like generated class name um, okay. that's scoped to the to the component. So if we save this, you can kind of see it in play. Yeah, 
And if we can, we can view the page source in a sec here. All right, so if we wrap that again. Oh, this, yeah, so we've got a auto-generated class, which is expected, and then we've got the same styling there. So that's that's super neat. Uh, I think I think it's still important to have global styles, but it's really nice that you can do these scope styles because I, th I think for a couple of reasons. One, it's, it's nice to keep it contained to the component, but I know, I think as a learning, well, maybe not a learning tool, but I think, you know, the cascade and specificity really trip up a lot of people, even, even experienced people still. And, but I, I'm thinking more like from a beginner perspective, like if I'm just learning some mm -hmm. HTML, having it scoped is, is a nice way to, you know, not get too overwhelmed right away, but you know, and then learn, learn as you go along, you know? So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And there is a, um, another way you can do scoped, <clears throat> excuse me, <sighs> scoped CSS in, as part of like the platform uh, and that is to use shadow dom and so this is like maybe uh too advanced for the stream but you can actually do like a declarative shadow dom um okay template inside of here and put a style sheet inside of that and then that will be scoped for you for free uh okay. in your shadow dom. um and that's part of the platform but it isn't available in yeah. safari and requires a polyfill for safari so um yeah i really don't really encourage that yet until um, we can get full ubiquitous cross-browser okay. support for it because the progressive enhancement um, experience in Safari then becomes, you need JavaScript to view the styles for this component, okay, which is yeah, yeah. not a good trade-off. Okay, and I'm just curious for the polyfill, because when I had dabbled in web components, like initially, Polymer.js was the thing from Google for polyfilling a lot of this stuff. Is that what you would mm -hmm. have to use for Safari or is it a smaller polyfill? No, it's a very tiny polyfill. Um, okay. It's like just a couple of lines and you can write it yourself from scratch. It's just like duplicating the style sheet inside of your shadow DOM. Um, oh, okay. That's really the only thing that it does um, okay. because style sheets inside of shadow DOM are scoped for free that's like a shadow dom feature so um okay yeah there's not much to it and it's not really about the um the performance cost of it but it's just about the progressive enhancement experience yeah um no for sure uh todd has a question in the chat um he's wondering aside from safari are there any other browsers that need that polyfill i mean we have firefox and mm -hmm. a lot of others are I don't think all other browsers are Chromium based, but I know like the major ones are like Microsoft Edge, even Opera is Chromium based now. I yeah, think. I definitely didn't just look that up, but it does look like Firefox needs um, <laughs> needs uh, the polyfill for declarative Shadow DOM as well. Yeah, and and Netscape too, my ink. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna drop a document dot layers in the chat. There we go. Um, Anyways, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Did you ever have that large book, uh, Learning Dynamic HTML? The the one that's like butcher block. It's like this was like. I, oh, you got it still? Okay. Uh yeah. Oh, this is my book right here. This is the one I started with. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh no, that's not the one I have. But I had one. It was like an. Oh, my first one. one. I think the learning dynamic HTML one I had was it had a flamingo on it and it was literally, I'd say almost three inches thick. And, you know, it was for, for the time when it was out, it was amazing, but like I was looking to make room in my shelf. So I finally took it to the goodwill, but, uh, so either somebody is cutting vegetables on it or they're reading about old ways of HTML. I don't know which though. Uh, yeah, this one's got, um, HTML 3.2. ActiveX front page, <laughs> all the classics. I just, I yeah, that's the book that got me into web development. Yeah, yeah, no, it's late nineties. Uh, yeah, ActiveX selects in in Internet Explorer. Anyways, I digress. I digress. Um, <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we won't talk about the Shadow DOM like you said because it's not widely supported, but uh, definitely encourage you to check that out. Oh, we're getting Silverlight uh, being thrown in the chat too now. Ooh. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. 
so so uh, yeah i really like that this is is scoped with the web like i think this is kind of nice that you can have the scoped until like it's widely supported and then you can encourage the new way i guess uh <laughs> Yeah, and this is actually extensible too. So you can override this behavior with your own, like if you want to add CSS modules to WebC, I'll probably have okay. an example of that at some point. Um, you okay. can override this in your WebC configuration too um, to okay. add your own behavior. Yeah, I know. that's interesting too. And like I know in, I think it's in Astro and probably in others too, but you can, you can add like a lang equals SCSS for SAS, I believe. Uh, mm. so that, that, that's something that could be, uh, interesting too. Um, yeah, but... for sure. WebC has, um, custom JavaScript renderers that you can add, um, to override this stuff as well. Okay, cool. All right. So we've got, we, we've got our styling story here. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So now say we want to add some interactivity in JavaScript land. We're going to do the same thing, right? So we'll add a script tag here. Yeah, I mean, when you want to add client-side interactivity, the problem that we're going to run into at this point is that we need the custom element to obey the standard naming conventions for custom elements, because oh, yeah, now we're okay. getting into client-side world. Um, so there's no way to add a custom element for the existing marquee tag, because that doesn't... Um, yeah, because it already exists, even though it's deprecated. And it, do the yeah. does the naming always have to be something dash something for a web component? Yeah, it needs to have a dash in the name for client side custom elements. Okay. Um, so you could add my marquee or okay, custom yeah. dash marquee or whatever you want to name it. Okay, so let's just do my dash marquee. Just close all these other ones. Close the side here. Let's get some real estate. And this is my marquee. Uh, ampersand. Doo -doo. Okay, so we've got that there now. So at this yeah, point. Yeah, and just interestingly, you will need to include a marquee tag here if you want marquee to be included. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and when you sense. do this, I'm predicting that you're going to run into a circular dependency error because you have marquee declared somewhere else. But okay, well, we'll, we'll skip the marquee. Well, actually, it won't be. I don't think it'll be a sing, It won't be a circular dependency error, but it will resolve to your other <laughs> to your other global component, which is probably not what you want. Yeah. So what we can do is we can we can just uh, delete the other one for now. It's okay. Um, oh yeah, it did compile. Okay, that's good. Okay. All right, so we have the marquee here now, and I guess the question, oh yeah, so now we need to go to, for the URL, I would have to go to my dash marquee then, or, oh no, it's No, you go back to your fun.webc file, which is your page yeah. file, and yeah. then um, you would change that to my dash marquee. Okay. Yep, there you go. And then, hmm. And that should be okay. it. No? It doesn't. It doesn't. Oh, seem we have an error. The... There's an error. Oh yeah. What's the error? Is it because I is it because I deleted the existing file? Maybe. Uh... Hmm. Oh yeah, it's looking for marquee.webc, which doesn't exist anymore. Is that possible that the? That's a bug. That the. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the stream is now turned into a triaging for eleven <laughs> D. It's a couple months. It's a couple of weeks old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. No, it's, it, this is fun. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing this here. Okay, so there we go. This is Marquee, my Marquee. All right, so we've got it there. So this is great. Okay, so now we have an actual uh, proper name for a web component. So how do you go about uh, registering this with either WebC or 11D, or do we just use the, the native DOM API to register a component or? Okay. Yeah. So at this point, 11D doesn't get involved in any client side JavaScript. So, um, we can create a custom element that, uh, has no 11D overhead. So all of the code that we're writing here is, um, non library code. Um, okay. So you you can just do custom elements and the casing of that is I think kind of awkward because it's a lower C and a upper E. Yeah. Yeah. Um, custom and elements. I can put that right in the bundle in here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then you and want define. 
Oh, define. That's it. Define is the one you want. Okay. All right. There we go. And then you'd pass Marking. in. Ooh, that is. Yep. Use that. Use it. <laughs> co co I would just delete the, the shadow stream, dump folks. stuff, but yeah. 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 Okay. So let's do that. Uh, we we don't need to do that. Okay. So okay. So it's extending the HTML lines. element class and. We don't need yeah, to get rid of right get rid of all of that and then change the constructor to connected callback. I usually use that one instead. There's two different there's a bunch of different lifecycle methods that you can use, but connected callback is the one I usually use because that's when it's um, linked in your client side DOM. Okay. Um, so if you just put like a console log inside of there, you could log this and it will output the your custom element your custom dom element okay so there we go and then i'll come back here let's just take a peek uh for the folks in the chat i'll zoom in the console one sec here okay so this logged out my custom element which is what we're seeing there so that, okay so that's awesome and and then at this point this is where this is where the nice uh, progressive enhancement story comes in because we can say like, here's what we rendered server side that will allow you to still use the website. But if we want to do something fancy that is not required, but can enhance an experience, we can do it here. Okay. Yeah. So inside there you can use, you can add your event listeners or whatever you want. Okay. So using standard DOM APIs. Yeah. So we could do a, uh... Let's do this dot add event listener. And then let's just say, I don't know, on click. And then in here, well, I'll leave clicked for now, sure. Okay, so let's come back here and let's, I don't need to refresh. So you can see I'm clicking on it and there we see it happening in the, in the console. So that's awesome. Cool, okay. And again, just to, just to drive the point home, this is all, platform like native platform specific also at, at event listener has been around forever for folks who might be familiar with just react and stuff this is kind of what on click does in a jsx under the hood it will eventually create an event listener that will do like a click for example um no this is really cool and so the the connected callback is essentially once the element has rendered the first time or is it every or is it, because I remember there's something else. Once like any a... element is attached to the page. So you could, at this point, you could dynamically create uh, a my marquee element in the console and attach okay. it. So say, for example, you're doing like an Ajax request or something for my dash yeah. marquee. Um, okay. It doesn't need to be available on page load at any point when you create an element and you attach it to the DOM, it will trigger that, yeah. that method. Uh Okay. 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 And I guess that's, I guess that's a nice kind of out of the box thing in terms of like, I, I, it's not the same thing, but it's almost kind of like a, a, if a component tree was re-rendering, you can say, Hey, something new's there. I can do something if I need to. So that, that's pretty interesting. Okay. I wasn't aware yeah. of that. No, that's nice. Okay. And, and I guess, uh, Say you wanted to register, and this isn't Web C specific or 11 D specific at all now, but in terms of the platform for uh, for uh, web components, uh, client side interactivity. If I wanted to register this like event listener only once, you know, like say something else came into the DOM and this is going to run again, like I could put a guard to say like, yes, it's already loaded, but is there something native where I could just say like, this is like register once, or I guess that's the constructor probably that we saw before. Yeah, there is. I mean, inside of add event listener specifically, there is a once option that oh, yeah. you can pass in. Um, yeah. And that might be the, the thing I would recommend, but that doesn't really answer your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, no, yeah, no. I mean, that's super handy too for other scenarios, but yeah, I mean more like instead of stop re-registering the click, cause like I would ex like mm. as a user, you would expect if I click it once, it'll do it once, but if it keeps re-registering, you'll end up with like N number of clicks every time you click, you know, so. Yeah, I think that the constructor um, does this for you. Okay. Um, yeah, so we could do that just for fun. I just want to see. Uh, 
and uh, I'm not, not like super confident about that. I feel well, what you know what we could do is and for folks who haven't done any object oriented programming, uh, constructors or what you do in classes. Um, so let's add it here. Um, close that. Okay, so I would expect that. And then I'm just going to add a, a console dot log. Um, and let's do yo. Okay. And just for fun, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to add something weird where I'm just creating Dom elements, uh, just to see if it, uh, see if it'll keep re-registering the click event. Uh, so if we do mm. set, this is, I'm going to, well, not that we had a script, but I'm just, uh, creating new stuff here. So let's just do document dot body dot append child, or, you know, I'm going to be lazy, uh, dot inner HTML plus equals, uh, P lobster. We're getting tons of lobsters. Okay. So let's come back here now. So it's still adding lobsters. Okay, you're, so you're right, Zach. The constructor's firing every time. Uh, and, and again, to be clear, this isn't a Web C thing. This is just the platform. Um, so that's interesting. Okay. I would have expected yeah, it to the... register once. We got I mean, a lot of lobsters. Well, I think it's dogs. every time. I think it's so the diff there's a bunch of different callback methods, or excuse me, lifecycle methods that go into the custom elements API. Uh, and I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but um, the constructor, I, I would guess, gets um, triggered every time you create a new custom element, and the connected yeah. callback gets triggered when you attach it to the DOM. Um, yeah, it's weird. Now I'm At least struggling to find the docs for it. Yeah, I think I crashed my browser. <laughs> I added too many lobsters. Uh, yeah, I think it's dead. too much main. Yeah, too much main, Todd. Too much main. Maybe should have gone uh, Atlantic hard shell. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Well, I'm going to say a prayer for that browser window and close it. All right. And we'll just open up another one. Um, but yeah, so again, th this is not Web C related. This is more platform specific. So at least from what I'm seeing here in the constructor, I'm adding the elements. So I would expect like the connected callback, I get that it would get called again and again, but I wasn't expecting the constructor to get called multiple times, but uh, maybe there's something I'm not clear about. Uh, oh, thanks for hanging, Todd. Take care. Um, but anyways, again, it's not Web C specific. It's something interesting to dive into in terms of web components to see. Um, okay. And what else here? Yeah. There's the docs for the lifecycle callbacks. I don't know that yeah. there is one built into um, run once per, per class. Yeah. You may have to code that yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely ways to guard it. You can, you know, like you could have like a variable that says just don't re-register um, the events, but uh, yeah. No, that's something I'll, I'll just kind of dig into. But uh, if folks are curious, um, yeah, no, it's a set interval in my uh, I added it in the constructor. Like the idea was to constantly add DOM elements so that the connected callback would keep firing from what Zach explained. But I wasn't expecting it to call the constructor again. That's the part that threw me off. Um, but again, uh, I'll, I'll look into that in terms of uh, web components. Yeah, I think the other okay. thing that's worth mentioning just as I'm going through the docs, um, okay. I, I do always like to mention the the um, pseudo class, the CSS pseudo class um, colon defined. Um, okay. If we can go back up to the CSS. Yeah, cool. Um, um, yeah, so if we add, yeah, host and then okay. defined. I mean, you can do this too, but I would scope it oh, to host right since we're already using Okay. But are you, do you mean like popping it right in here? Like you can use nested in there or is that what you no, mean? No, uh, I would say uh, you'd use colon host, colon defined. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Oh, not undefined. Sorry. Got JavaScript on the brain. I don't think that uh, exists. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so the so colon defined is is a really interesting one that you get for free as part of the platform too, um, and that triggers when your custom element is defined in JavaScript. So that's kind of a way oh, to okay. guard styles that are uh, like a JavaScript enhanced experience as well. Okay, so that's in, okay, and I. I I mean, we could demonstrate that by changing color or something, but this is super mm -hmm. interesting in terms of the non-progressively enhanced view could have a certain set of style because it just doesn't need all this other stuff. And then once it becomes a, like a live component, no, that's super interesting. And uh, I could see that being an interesting debugging tool too, as well, in terms of CSS, you know, like, um, cool, cool. Um, Demetrius is asking in the chat, um, if you have some good resources on learning the basics of web components, I, I would say go to MDN, but do you have others that you might recommend or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, this is a hard question because when you get into, uh, when you get into web components fundamentals, a lot of, uh, educational resources really push shadow DOM. And I really okay. feel like shadow DOM is an advanced thing that beginners should not be exposed to um, okay. because it just overcomplicates the entire thing and um, gotcha. yeah, makes a lot of wrinkles that are not beginner friendly. So I do not actually know. I'm going to say I don't know a good resource that, that does web components fundamentals without mentioning Shadow DOM. If you okay. run into one, definitely let, one, let me know. But I think that that's definitely a missing um an educational resource that's missing right now um, in okay. the larger ecosystem. Well, for anybody who's a content creator and looking to fill a, a gap and uh, potentially benefit from it and instant, help others. Uh, yeah, instant yeah, retweet exactly. from me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Mayang's saying uh, they avoided web components for years basically because of Shadow DOM. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and I, I, uh, I mean, I heard on the grapevine the other day on Twitter that Shadow DOM was originally introduced for third-party components, like third-party embeds and okay. advertisements, um, and it's certainly not uh, marketed as that nowadays. It's like a baseline core thing when folks talk about web components, but... To me, yeah. that makes a lot more sense in this in terms of like I want this completely isolated standalone thing that exists in in a very harsh like third party environment, um, mm -hmm. and it makes a lot more sense in that case. But um, I think for baseline component development, it's not the most useful thing, there, especially not for beginners. Yeah, if if folks are curious though, like if you go to YouTube, they use web components, and you can see. If you open up like the, I believe the, there's a YouTube component in there and you'll see if you go in the dev tools, it'll show that like parts that are shadow DOM. I believe it explicitly says shadow DOM when you look at it. Um, uh, but yeah, ba basically it's, it's the DOM within the component that in th from what I remember when I read about this and kind of briefly dabbled, it's like it's DOM that can't be manipulated outside the component. I think there's... I know for CSS, there's still some escape hatches to, to have stuff leak in. And I don't know if it's still the same case with Shadow DOM, but... Uh... Yeah, it's DOM with a turtle shell around it. Okay. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Um, and that's another thing that WebC does too. Is so when you get into Shadow DOM, if you find a Shadow DOM example on the web, you'll see that it is like this, almost like a portal, because <laughs> you can map slots, okay. So which is... Uh, like oh, child okay. content inside of your component definition, you can map the slots to Shadow DOM slots. Um, oh, and cool. you can see that in DevTools. If you go in and look in an example, you'll see this, like the component and slot mapping. So inside WebC, you can actually pre-process slots as well. So do server generated slots and avoid oh, the Shadow okay. DOM entirely. Um, okay. So yeah, slot expansion is a feature that you get for free in WebC. Okay, and that's nice because I know in other frameworks some people are used to that. The slots don't exist in React. You can create slots by just creating different props. But I, th I think it was I can't remember if it's Svelte or Vue or both. But I, I know one of them at least supports slots as a concept, like built in. Yeah, Vue does. I th yeah, it's Vue. That's it. Yeah, I can't remember if uh, Svelte does, but uh, okay. yeah, I don't remember either. I see okay, both. Yeah. yeah, both. It's good. It's good. Cool. Um, 
Well, I got to tell you, Zach, I could probably talk to you like the rest of the day, <laughs> but I do have to get back oh, to work at not. some point. <laughs> we're, we're, we're almost out of time. We got about three minutes, um, but um, if you ever want to come on again, I'd love to chat again. We could have some more fun with some other stuff. You maybe even dig into Shadow Dom, even though it's not supported or like, like you said, it's a difficult concept for at least beginners potentially. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, but this has been awesome. Like I loved how quickly we were able to, well, getting Eleventy setups pretty quick out of the box. Uh, getting stuff running with WebC was pretty quick as well. You know, I fumbled a little bit with like config and stuff, but like in general, the experience was like pretty quick to get up and running. You know, if you're familiar with some basics of uh, markup, CSS and, and JavaScript, I, I think this is pretty powerful to get up and running really quick. Yeah, I mean, I always love explaining uh, new setups to folks because I always run into a few more wrinkles that we can get ironed out for other people. So, um, yeah. yeah, look forward to those to those being fixed at some point. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. All right, so um, I'm going to just drop some links to where people can find you on the web, so your website and Twitter. And, oh, thanks, Demetrius. Uh, Demetrius said this was dope, so... I feel cool now. Um, I'm going to drop some Stand links school to... kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I dropped some links to Levendy, uh, Levendy YouTube, and Levendy on GitHub and Twitter. And I'll just drop the WebC project again. Uh, thanks again, Zach, for coming on. This was really great. And uh, thanks for everybody who joined today and love the, the chatter in the chat there. Uh, thanks for the new followers and, and new, new chatters. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, next week, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure Rizal Scarlett from GitHub's going to be on. We're going to be talking about GitHub code spaces. We've got a lot of other awesome folks coming on. I'm just going to drop the schedule in. Um, we're also going to be talking, not we, uh, me. Uh, we're, uh, I'll I'm come back. Bob Dole. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zach will be back to you. Um, Co-host. Here's this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got some more interesting folks. Uh, the folks behind Behance, uh, Simon McDonald reached out to me, so he, he wanted to talk about uh, the Enhance.dev project, uh, which is, uh, he, I, I was on a Twitter, not, I was listening to a Twitter space the other day about it, and they were, they were giving some high praise to WebC, so uh, just wanted to oh, mention nice. that. They love the awesome. projects, and so, cool, cool. All right, well, take care, everybody, and we'll see you next week. There you go.